Um, so today, my talk is Cloud in Your Cloud, How We Build DigitalOcean. Kind of basically, this is going to be a talk about how we use microservices and Go to build out our cloud. So DigitalOcean is a cloud to make developers happy. So like a lot of our internal tooling is about making us happy to make us build productive systems. Uh, I saw there's a lot of really great talks today about you know, detailed Go stuff. I thought it would be really interesting to break out some production microservices and how we go all the way from building, deploying, monitoring uh, microservices. Um, so, yep. Yeah. So just really quick about me. Uh, I'm a technical lead at DigitalOcean. I have a book, uh, Microservices and Go and I live in Bangkok, so I probably traveled more than some of the, most of the people here, but I'm super excited to be here. So you might be saying, okay, so you guys are building kind of cloud services. You guys are probably at a very different scale. Some of our applications were deploying to tens of thousands of nodes. You're like, does that really kind of apply to like my application that's maybe running on a dozen nodes or 15 nodes? And I really want to show that it does, and I kind of want to walk through. We have a kind of three different styles of applications. So we have some stuff internally, like our APIs or our web front ends that run on maybe 10 machines, 15 machines, something like that. Um, but then we have a couple services, one of the services I work on, that runs on our entire fleet. So every time it gets deployed, it gets deployed onto 10,000, 20,000 hypervisors. And we're actually working on a product now that gets deployed to every single customer's VM. So that's going to start to be millions, millions of customers that run this microservice that's hitting our backends. So I kind of want to like walk through each one of these different scales and kind of show you some of the techniques we've deployed to do service discovery, how we do builds, how, you know, how do we do metrics and monitoring, and how, how it all kind of comes together. Um, to have a stable system. So kind of the, the main product I work on is metrics. Um, and for our customers, that means if you have a virtual machine with us, you get your CPU, you get your memory, you get kind of get all the very traditional metrics, right? And this application is running on maybe 12 machines. It's just, it's a few microservices, uh, it's a few databases, but to actually collect the metrics, has to actually run on every single hypervisor, because we have to actually run the information off of every hypervisor. So this is, as we talk, you can keep in mind, this is kind of the application that I'm talking about, and we can, we're gonna delve into different parts of it and um, how it gets built. So I wanna really start off with how we build Go code. Because there seems there's a lot of contentious, so there's a lot of different ways I've seen different people build Go code. Um, I think internally, a lot of the people from DigitalOcean started over at Google, so you'll see a lot of the techniques that I talk about are probably very similar to what they're doing. And there's going to be some controversy here. Uh, so I'm just going to start that off. So first off, who here knows what a monorepo is? Okay, I could bid people. All right. Uh, who here actually uses a monorepo? Only like four people. All right, all right, that's cool. So this is always the most contentious slide that I do, which is really always very funny because I talk about a lot of other stuff, but the monorepo, people come up to me and they're like, no way. There's no way this monorepo thing can work. So essentially what a monorepo is is that you take the, all the code of your entire company and you run it in a single Git repository. And you say, that's crazy. Why would you ever want to do that? Um, so, for example, we have, we, have a we have a logging library that goes across our entire company. And every time you build a new microservice, you automatically become part of the logging infrastructure, and it gets logged out. But now, if we want to make a cross-cutting change to logging, we don't want to go and modify 50 different Git repos, right? So what happens is one single commit will happen, is we want to change how the logging, we change to JSON formatted logging, for example. We made one commit across 50 different microservices, and then as soon as every other group deploys their new microservice, they get the new, they get the new changes. Now, there is a lot of downsides to, to monorepos also. As you can imagine, you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen. 
So we have like 50 to 100 developers in our main mono repo. So like when a pull request comes in, you can have things like people gang up and they're like, oh, this isn't right or this isn't right. And you know, some of the ways we've combated that is we have automated linting tools for Go, which we're gonna be open sourcing soon. And basically, we have a whole bunch of style rules that we have internally. And instead of like having arguments on PRs, we have bots that hook into our GitHub. And the bots come in and they say, oh, this Go code doesn't look like the Go code that we expect. And that way, there's no arguments. And that cut down on a huge amount of like the pain of the mono repo. Um, the other thing we've done is we say that groups own certain areas of the mono repo. So if you change something in a different area, that group owns it, only they comment on the PRs. So this is how we kind of keep the context down, but we still get a lot of the main advantages of the Rano repo where like we can change our whole infrastructure. Or another great example of why you would use a mono repo was um, there was like a, a, a a libc vulnerability about two months ago in Linux, and it was like remote execution. So we could actually patch all of our programs at once, right? And, and if we had somebody that quit the company, we would still have all of the stuff that they wrote patched because we didn't have to go find it. Um, the next kind of part of building internally is we do pull request driven development. Um, who here does that? Or, Okay, about half. So if you don't know, basically pull request driven development says you don't ever check into master. You never check in code. Every single feature we do, we make a feature branch, then I make a pull request, and somebody has to approve my pull request. So that means that there's always a code review before every single thing that goes into the master. Um, so that way we kind of increase a level of quality across all the code, and we kind of keep small incremental bytes. And then when we have problems, it makes it very easy to roll back because it's like incremental blocks of changes that are actually happening in our code base. Um, this isn't quite building, but I, I wanted to touch on this slightly, and I, I hope there's some more talks about this today. So this is actually something that's been happening in our company. So traditionally, all of our microservices internally were HTTP and JSON, and now we're moving everything over to gRPC. Um, anybody here using gRPC? Okay, like about five, 10 people in the audience. And why are we moving to gRPC? So one of the things about HTTP and JSON is there's no way to describe your services, right? So if you have two different groups that are working with each other, what we found was that like, oh, maybe I changed some code and I changed the actual schema of the services, or I need to write documentation to describe all the microservices that my team exposes, so that way if other team wants to use the metric service. But what's really nice about using gRPC is that we can actually have schemas, and we have defined schemas and automatic client generation for multiple languages. So like half of our code base is in Ruby, we have code bases in Perl and in Go, they can actually get client libraries generated them from the actual schema of the gRPC. Now you can do this with HTTP JSON if you're using something like Swagger, but we found that most of the HTTP based libraries just weren't as good at schema generation and modif the communities just weren't as strong. So, um, so the next part, so now that we've built, we talked a little bit about how we actually build our code for a microservice. When we actually run microservices, I think service discovery is the first pillar of all good microservices. Because I don't know if you traditionally deployed apps, you would put in, you would hard code in your config file like, oh, the database is at this IP address or maybe it's at this DNS name. But now in microservices, every single thing should be using service discovery to find where things are. Um, who here uses console? Oh wow, half the audience, yeah, that's good. I, I'm a big fan. Uh, etcd? Only four or five people, well, we use it too. Uh, Zookeeper? Okay, just a few people, thank God. We, <laughs> that's a nightmare. Uh, we, we do have to run it, but like we, we, we definitely don't like Zookeeper. Um, we're definitely big fans of console. Um, so one of the reasons that I suggest people using console, if you haven't ever done service discovery or you're kind of new to microservices, console is just like, it's really nice because it just kind of works right out of the box. 
So you basically, you throw up console, there's libraries for Go, like, or you don't even need to use libraries. You can use like, they have standalone programs that you can install on your server. So like if you have things like Nginx or HAProxy, things that don't know about service discovery, they already have integrations like on the web. And what's awesome is they have an amazing UI for console. So what happens is as we add new services in the company, I can find out all the microservices that exist in the company. Maybe I don't know all the developers in our company because it's starting to get large, but I can find all the microservices. I can find where they're deployed. It also understands different regions. So for, for example, for us, we have 11 different data centers right now. So like to make sure that the microservices are favoring microservices in their current data center, or can fail over to other data centers. There's a lot of really nice things that console can kind of do right out of the box. And it will take you about half an hour to learn console, and then you'll, you'll, your life will be so much better. I think half the audience uses it for this reason. Um, so if we look at the app that we were talking about earlier, so we have that metrics GUI, right? And basically the metrics GUI is, it's just very, it looks like a very traditional app. It's a couple of microservices. We have a specialized Prometheus cluster. We have a MySQL database. But the thing is, is that even between the microservices and MySQL, we don't hard code IP addresses. The MySQLs are even registered in console. So that means that like, if ops people need to take down a MySQL slave, they can mark the slave down in console. Or if they need to add new slaves, they can just add them into console, and the application automatically knows about them. And what was really cool is as we moved deployment mechanisms, so like originally we were deploying this on virtual machines, and we moved some of the app onto Kubernetes. The apps, the different parts of the stack were very unaware of this change because they just used console and they, they didn't really have to care about the links. And that's why I think that's going to be the biggest win of all microservices, even if you don't go with a full-blown microservice architecture. Just adding service discovery into your architecture is probably going to be like one of the biggest wins that you're going to make. I, I did want to talk about one really cool thing that's probably not super applicable to us. Is um, when I originally got to DigitalOcean, we were writing this metrics where we had to put the metrics on every hypervisor. Well, we were getting, we were like buying a thousand servers a day or something ridiculous. And what would happen is somebody would come to my desk and be like, why is the metrics not on the new servers, right? And I'd be like, oh, because I didn't know the new servers existed to deploy them. So what we do now is we actually use console to discover every time new servers are there. And that's how we can actually find our new metrics. So we use Prometheus internally. And now Prometheus can find new hypervisors as they get ranked. And nobody needs to tell me. But what's really interesting about console compared to the other ones is that it can actually do broadcasts. So let's say that we have, we have like five console servers that are, that are servicing about 10 or 20,000 nodes. And you think, well, that's a pretty big scale. But what happens is console can gossip between different nodes and actually find other nodes. And then it doesn't actually have to strain the servers. So it actually scales pretty wide. But we were kind of worried when we originally deployed it. So we started off and we had maybe 100 machines being used, using console. And we said, oh, that's good. We deployed it to 1,000 machines. And we're like, oh, this is awesome. This is going to be great. This is going to be totally awesome. We deployed it to 10,000 machines. And all of a sudden, somebody from the network team pigged me. And he's like, um, all of our firewalls are at 100% CPU utilization. Um, would you know anything about this? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> um, what we ended up finding out was just totally ridiculous was that apparently in Linux, the ARP cache is only like 100 machines. So if you have 1,000 machines talking to each other, you constantly lose your ARP cache. And as soon as we bumped the ARP cache, we were able to run console on like 10,000 machines with like five tiny virtual machines as the actual primary servers. And they, have, they sit at like 1% CPU utilization. It's really nice. So, I definitely, it, so it doesn't really matter your scale. The console is going to do what you need. Um, I, I, I want to briefly touch on this. So 
Traditionally, a lot of the, the service discovery like etcd and Zookeeper were all API-based. A lot of the newer ones like console are actually exposing what are DNS serve records. And basically, DNS serve records define what the application and the port are. And you can integrate applications that don't know about service discovery. Uh, and as you look for a service discovery tool, this is something that you want to really look for. Uh, so deployment. So now we've, we've built stuff, we can find stuff, we're like, how do we deploy it, right? Um, so having a mono repo is really nice. So basically, every time we have a commit into master, every single thing in our company gets rebuilt, and we have integration tasks across all the microservices, right? And then each team can deploy as they need. And what we've done now is, what we do is after each build, we actually deploy, we, we build a Docker image for every single microservice that we have in the company. Now, we don't necessarily deploy it at that point, but then any, anything can be deployed. So, for, my, for example, on my team, we deploy like two or three times a day. And we find that that ends up being a lot less problematic because we're, because we're changing very little. And the thing is, is, we know that we're not breaking other teams because in the micro repo, in the, in, the, in the mono repo, we have integration tests between microservices on different teams. And we can actually ensure that like, the code is continuing working with each team. And we don't have to worry as much about breaking. Um, the other thing we do is feature flags. Who, anybody here use feature flags in their app? Not enough. There's like 10 people. Like everybody should use it. So basically what feature flags are is like as we're building prototype code. So like one of the things we really like to do is we like to segment like a small base of our users. So we'll have like a beta test of like 100 or 1,000 users. And we'll have feature flags that are actually filtered for certain users. So if we have certain pieces of code that is not super stable, we'll actually have feature flags that only allow that small group, and they know that they're kind of testing a very experimental feature in our cloud, but then we can actually still deploy to production. And we kind of have a rule, we never keep multiple branches open at the same time. In previous projects and companies, like we would have multiple branches, we would have multiple versions going into production. We never do that. We always deploy master. If we need to have multiple functionality, we just use feature flags. Um, occasionally, we do have to do incremental rollouts. So we're really like cheap about how we do this. So like, for example, one of the things I do is has to be deployed onto hypervisors. So that means that there's no way to do like blue, green, or red, red, black deployments. So what we do is we just incrementally do like 1% of the cluster at a time. When I deploy an app that has to go to everything, that's just a really easy way to do it. Now, not all apps can do that, but that's something we do do. Monitoring. This is kind of my favorite area. I, I, build, I build monitoring products for our customers, and I love building monitoring internally, so I, I get really, really excited about this. Um, kind of the core monitoring we use internally at DigitalOcean is Prometheus, and there's actually a Prometheus talk later today. You guys should all go, you should go see. But um, basically, what's really cool about Prometheus is we can actually scale it a lot further out than like Graphite. Who, who here uses like Graphite? Okay, we got about four people. How about uh, InfluxDB? Okay, a couple people. And anybody want to call out another tool that they use for graphing other than that? Librato. Librato. Okay, that's cool. Datadog. Datadog. Yeah. Oh, those are cool guys. They're actually in New York too. Any any other ones? Yeah, so there, there's like so many options right now. Um, we're, we're like big into Prometheus just internally. Um, one of the reasons is that we can actually, s Prometheus works very differently than like things like um, Graphite. So like Graphite and, and all those, you push metrics in. Prometheus, you actually pull metrics. So that way if your metric server is actually getting overloaded, it will actually scale back and be able to uh, backload itself. So it's very good for our environment because sometimes we'll spin up a thousand of something and we don't want our whole infrastructure to go down because we, we, we're sending too many metrics, which we had happen with OpenTSDB, which was a total nightmare. Um, 
And what's kind of cool is if, if you're running multiple data centers, so I, I know a lot of people still are probably deploying in one data center, but now I'm starting to see more and more apps that are getting deployed into multiple data centers, even, even just from a failability. And one of the things that we do is really cool is we actually aggregate the metrics per region into a global aggregate. So that way we have a dashboard to see the health of all the regions, and then we can kind of drill down into each region. Um, and if you're not using Grafana, you should just throw away anything you have and you start using Grafana because this is probably the single most best, well, it's probably my favorite piece of software that I've ever used. Um, what we do is we have a single Grafana server for the entire company, so that way you can have, you can, if, if you need to debug a service that you don't know about, we have saved charts of basically every single group in the company. And it doesn't take any load because the Grafana will query your Prometheus, OpenTSDB, InfluxDB, Graphite, and we have all of those <laughs> between different groups. So it, it's really nice if you end up having multiple gra uh, metric solutions on your back end. Um, I want to talk a little bit about structured logging. Um, so it's basically structured logging, traditional logging is like, you're just logging out log lines. And you're just saying, oh, this user did this at this time. But structured logging is actually breaking it down into actually like, into like something that's machine readable, right? Um, anybody here actually using structured logging? Yes! This has changed. So about a year ago, it was like four people in the room. And now it's about three-fourths of the room. So I'm super excited that that, this is like the one thing that I think is probably the most important for us to be able to monitor our infrastructure. Um, so for anybody that doesn't know, basically we log all of our logs as JSON. Um, and syslog supports JSON natively. So it's not like you even have to have any kind of crazy setup. In fact, we just use our syslog and we dump our syslog into Elasticsearch. Um, and then we use Kibana. So what's really cool is once you actually start doing structured logging, you can, you can do pretty cool queries. Let's see if it's gonna play here. You can do queries like, uh, we log the username into every request. So if a user complains that they're having slowness in the system, we can like actually filter all of the log lines to that user. And a lot of times we can see if they had a slow request, maybe they hit a microservice that was failing. Um, so we get a lot of really kind of cool stuff that we get from using Kibana. It, is, is anybody here using Kibana? Okay, everybody basically. And what is somebody that's not using Kibana? What are they using for structured logging? Splunk. What? Splunk, Splunk yep. Sumo Logic. Sumo Logic. Log DNA. Log DNA. Logly. Oh wow, there's a lot of different logging solutions. Um, we end up liking this one because it works really well. Um, we have a lot of logs. We have something like 50 dedicated Elasticsearch servers just to store logs. And we have like syslog aggregators. What's cool is if you use our syslog, you can actually make regional aggregators in every region if you have lots of logs. And you can actually pipe them through that so that way you can handle spurts because Elasticsearch tends to like get really wonky when you get into terabytes and terabytes of logs. Um, the other fun thing that you can do once you have the structured log is you can actually create dashboards. So in some cases, and some of the applications we have don't have metrics, they just log metrics into the structured logging. And we can still make uh, dashboards of like the performance and things like that from the actual structured logs. And I think at some point, logging and metrics are just gonna kind of combine into one thing, but that hasn't quite happened yet, but it, it's certainly, um, certainly happening. Yeah, and this is what I was talking about, is that what we do is each microservice logs to our syslog on the local machine, and then we have an aggregator per data center, and that aggregator stores the logs temporarily, and then they pushes it all into New York, so we just have our main logging cluster in one region in New York, and um, that's how we actually buffer the logs because we have 11 different data centers, so we have to actually buffer the logs before we push it into New York. 
because otherwise we'd end up losing logs along the way. Um, the last thing that I really kind of wanted to touch on, I've kind of gone all over the map of microservices and what we're doing, is distributed tracing. And I think this is still a, an area that's not well done yet, even in, in, in the Go world or in other areas. Um, basically what distributed tracing is, is that if you have microservices that call microservices that call microservices, how do you know what the path was for a single user, right? So you end up having to have transaction IDs when a, when a, when a user hits something on the public, and then you need to have transaction IDs that are like child IDs for every single microservice that it hits down the way, right? And then you have to store all this somewhere and then somehow recombine it into like, into a chart, right? So it's actually a very complicated thing to do distributed tracing. Uh, the previous talk, Peter was talking about this briefly also. Uh, there is a tool called Zipkin from, from uh, Twitter. I don't recommend it. It's really bad. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's really painful. Like, but they have the good idea, right? So like, they have the kind of the general idea of like how distributed tracing should work. There's a library called Open Tracing, so you can like send traces and stuff. But I feel like the actual storage and the UI is still not very good. Uh, if you ever want a freaking awesome Go project, write a GUI for distributed tracing. Like everybody would use it, and everybody would love you. Um, <laughs> so that that's something I feel like is really missing in the ecosystem. There's a couple startups that are doing some stuff, like App Dynamics and stuff. But I feel like there's not there's definitely nothing good on the open source side. Um, really, the last thing is um, I just kind of think what ended up being really cool was we, we use Nagios internally to do a lot of monitoring of our systems. And over time, Nagios was just not a very good tool. And what we found was a combination of console and Prometheus, so both our metrics and our service discovery, ended up being a better monitoring tool. So like, if your service discovery thinks nodes are down or thinks services are down, then you have, you, you have a problem and your service is down. Right? And you don't have to have yet another system like Nagios do it. Or if your metric system says that your, your services is too slow, that's something that you couldn't really do traditionally in Nagios. You couldn't like monitor your services based on like performance or, or those kind of metrics. So those are the kind of two things that we're seeing is that we're slowly moving away from very traditional network monitoring to more like application level monitoring to actually tell if the health of the microservice is actually like the way it is. Um, and that's it.